So Vinay is presently Associate Professor of Geography and Global Studies at the University of Minnesota, and Adjunct Associate Professor of Geography at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He's past editor of Anthropod, and he's a current co-editor of the Anthropod book series. The locus of Vinay's research is on the, on the, uh, the geographically variegated trajectories of the agrarian question. His primary concerns here are threefold. First, the cultural politics and geographies of work. Second, second the, more than, the more than human uh, constitution of social relation. And third, the emergent trains of poverty, injustice, stigma, and struggle. Benet tells me that he's presently wrestling with a project um, called The Afterlives of Waste that examines the spatial histories, political uses, and contemporary political economy of waste as both um, commodity detritus and social excess. His analytical approach builds on a range of intellectual currents, most prominently agrarian and development studies, subaltern studies, and various strands of Marxism. Please be on the lookout for Vinay's forthcoming articles, one in Transaction, uh, as well as in the journal Comparative Studies in South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, where some of the work of this project is being um, published. And we're all eagerly awaiting his forthcoming book in progress, provisionally titled The Afterlives of Waste, Contribution to a Post-Colonial Critique of Political Economy. It's my distinct pleasure to, uh, to present Vinay Gidwani to you, a scholar whose work reflects a restless in intellect, as well as a deep and profound humanity. Vinay. know that you're all here for the group fest, and I'm just a sideshow. <laughs> but in that spirit, I'm going to try and warm you up for the group fest. <laughs> and um, I'm going to do that by, uh, I guess, throwing some round curses at the Antipode Editorial Collective seated there, the foursome, the, fear, the fierce foursome of Tariq Jazeel, Catherine McKittrick, Jenny Pickrell, Sharachari, and Nick Theodore seated here. Thank you for inviting me, and, and also, as I said, curses for inviting me to present the Antipode Lecture. I can't tell you what an honor it is, and I can't tell you how frightened I am. <laughs> My affection and esteem for the journal and the Antipode Project can't be put into words, so I'm not going to try. This talk was meant, among other things, to honor the memory of Stuart Hall, who passed away on the 10th of February, 2014, in London, UK. His brilliant writings continue to be a formative influence on my work. And although I won't pitch this talk as a panegyric to Hall, I hope his imprint on my thought and this talk will be abundantly clear. Before I get into the talk itself, I want to acknowledge a number of people who have helped me work through the ideas that I'm going to present before you. Many of them have a speculative form and I've taken the liberty of presenting ideas that are still in process to an audience like this, precisely because there are so many of you in this audience who I admire, who I have deep affection for, and who have been teachers. I've learned from your work. So I can think of no better place to uh, make myself vulnerable, I guess. So let me begin with uh, Charles Dickens. And I'll give you a moment to read here from Charles Dickens. But as you can see, what Dickens has to say here is this is from the Christmas Carol, and he's talking about the surplus population. The talk is organized into five sections, and it's a sprawling argument, but I hope it coheres. I'm going to begin with 
a story about one person, a person who does not have a property in jobs. This is a phrase that I adapt from a magnificent article by Peter Worsley, the sociologist, called Franz Fanon and the Lumpen Proletariat, which was published in 1972 in the Socialist Register. So Bhagwan, a way speaker in Delhi, somewhere in his 50s, has been scavenging for almost 30 years. He hails from the North Indian state of Himachal Pradesh and left home in his 20s after a rift with his father. Armed with a high school degree, he came to Delhi expecting to find a service sector job as a clerk. I wanted to become somebody, he muses. But his dreams were thwarted. After months of futility and sporadic income from manual labor, he turned in desperation to waste picking. Casually apprenticing with an acquaintance who, display, who displaying a generosity not at all uncommon among the city's poor, showed Bhagwan the rudiments of the waste trade, along the way dispensing a few survival tips. Where to go, where not to, what to do, and what not to. Who is safe, who is to be feared, and so on. Bhagwan describes how he was initially disgusted by the dirty work of sifting, dirty work of sifting through garbage. But I got used to it eventually, he says. The garbage provides me a means to live. How can I be repulsed by something that secures my existence? Like others, Bhagwan was able to get into picking because barriers to entry in terms of skills, experience, and overhead costs are minimal. In spite of his fraught departure from home 30 years ago, Bhagwan has kept his bonds intact. He's unmarried, therefore unburdened by the obligations of an immediate family. As such, he's intermittently able to send money to help with his rural family's needs. Agriculture and animal husbandry, mainstays of Himachal Pradesh's economy, have become increasingly less viable prompting widespread, primarily male, emigration to cities and into the armed forces. It is common to encounter taxicab drivers and personal chauffeurs in Delhi who hail from Himachal Pradesh. While driving is considered a respectable line of work, Bhagwan's is not. He used to worry what people from his village would think when they discovered he had fled to Delhi only to become a lowly waste picker. Would they mock him? Fearful and ashamed, he was guarded about his source of livelihood for many years. But that's all in the past. He no longer frets, he says. While memories of his rural upbringing remain thick, time has washed away their vividness and hold over him. The city owns him now. He knows it intimately. And even though he hasn't managed to rise out of poverty and, his, and its attendant hardships, for example, he commutes by bus three hours daily, to get to and from his workplace in central Delhi, the city has emerged as a space of autonomy where he's able to live a relatively unencumbered life. Bhagwan's experience of finding a livelihood handling waste in the urban informal economy and his relationship to the city is not unique. Many waste pickers recount similar stories of stumbling into this line of work. Although the reasons that brought them to the city in the first place and their encounters within it vary, sometimes sharply from Bhagwan's. For many, the city is a constant struggle. For some, the city is unremittingly hostile. Such is life for people without property in jobs. How many people fall into this category, people without property in jobs? Before I answer that question, Let's picture India's economy. While many facts about the state of India's economy are disputed, one that is commonly accepted across the political spectrum is the decline in average operational holdings in rural India and a corresponding rise in effective landlessness. From 44.2% of rural households in 1962, to 60.15% by 2003. It's a fairly sharp and secular rise over this 40 year period. It's important to mark that what is happening is not classic proletarianization, but rather the persistence of smallholder agriculture as in many other parts of the world. 
In 2003, according to the government of India's National Sample Survey Organization, the statistical arm of the state, 63% of all landowners fell into the category of marginal farmers operating less than one hectare of land. Another 18% were small farmers operating less than two hectares. In both these categories, few, if any, were able to accumulate capital through agriculture. As with landless laborers, they were compelled to supplement their incomes and do so from the informal economy. Thus, Henry Bernstein, the agrarian studies scholar, suggests a new concept, classes of labor, to encompass all those who have to pursue their reproduction through insecure and oppressive and tip increasingly scarce wage employment or a range of likewise precarious, small-scale and insecure informal sector activity, including farming. James Lerche explains that classes of labor thus include those who possess some means of production, but who nevertheless share with wage laborers the overall position of being exploited and oppressed, and who indeed may alternate between being wage workers and being small-scale petty commodity producers seasonally or throughout their lifetimes. Contemporary capitalism does not provide a generalized living wage for these classes of labor. Petty commodity production, be it rural or urban, signals the distress of the laboring classes. In short, while pressure on farm-based employment remains high, thanks to a multiplication in classes of labor, data from various rounds of the National Sample Survey Organization shows a process of diversification out of agriculture that is slow but accelerating. Significantly, the same data also reveals that with growth of the non-farm sector, there is a declining quality of non-farm jobs, notably in the direction of increased casualization of non-farm employment away from regular salaried employment. In fact, the persistently high share of the non-farm workforce engaged in forms of self-employment is a striking feature of India's emerging employment landscape, and I was hazard to say, probably the landscape of many other countries in the global south. Evidence is mixed on the success of programs launched in various Indian states under the auspices of the National Employment Guarantee Act in 2005 in arresting the impoverishment and outmigration, seasonal or otherwise, of economically vulnerable rural populations. While some data point to tightening in agricultural labor markets with upward pressure on farm wages, there is also other data that suggests that the results are much more agnostic. The evidence on urban in-migration is similarly agnostic. Some recent analyses suggest a decline in migration to India's large cities, the metros, but a rise in migration to smaller cities and towns. Whatever the empirical reality, it is apparent that India's formal economy is incapable of absorbing the influx of job seekers. Indeed, employment statistics constructed from national, from official National Sample Survey Organization data indicates exactly the reverse. An expansion in lower quality casual employment via two mechanisms. Insecure work in the informal sector combined with casualization of previously secured jobs in the formal sector. And this pie chart is quite uh, stunning. As you will see, informal employment in India is about 92.7% and formal sector employment is the remainder. Um, what's striking is that much of the period between 1999 and 2005, which is sometimes considered the heydays of liberalization of the Indian economy, shows a 
period of jobless growth in the formal economy. And there was employment creation, but almost all of it was in informal sector enterprises. So according to the National Sample Survey Organization's 2011-12 report on informal sector and conditions of employment in India, 80% of informal sector employment is based on oral agreement and 72% of those employed receive no type of social security. Now here's another startling statistics for you which is demonstrating the growth in casualization of previously formal sector employment, which is again something that I think is marked um, across countries, both in the peripheries as well as the core. And here's the damning conclusion that one of the government of India's own commissions came to, this finding of jobless growth in this very crucial period. Um, you will see that most of the growth that occurred in this five-year stretch was in the informal economy. And here's what the latest report from the government of India shows. Much of the employment in the informal economy is without a written contract. It's based on oral agreement. And the bulk of those who work in these jobs have no type of social security whatsoever. What's even more startling is this, which shows, and I direct your attention to the numbers I've highlighted in yellow, which shows that um, many of the, the bulk of um, informal sector enterprises in India are in fact micro enterprises employing less than three people. And much of employment creation in India is in these micro enterprises. So something's going on here, and, and something that d demands uh, our attention. Now, waste pickers and informal waste economies, which I've been working on for several years now, employ a very large number of these people without property in jobs. So it's estimated, and there are no accurate estimates, obviously, that about 1% of India's urban population is employed in various waste-related activities, which makes it about 4 million people. That's a large number of people employed in these activities. Let me move on now to some of the theoretical implications of what I have just shown you in terms of India's evolving employment landscape. In his recent monograph, Marx's Temporalities, the Italian philosopher Massimiliano Tomba writes that the modern concept of history orders and temporalizes an enlarged geographical field of experience by producing an axiology between that which is developed and that which is residual. It produces a determinate imaginary of politics and therefore a determinate figure of politics that we call progress. Progress is a synonym of advancing along a vector of a given orientation whose tendency, the theory of history, claims to be able to discern. What Tomba does not say is that this determinist, determinate figure of politics that we call progress identifies and strives to interpolate, interpolate an ideal political subject, economic man, the working class. It also demarcates those who deviate from this ideal, classes of labor, people without property and jobs. Now, a theory of history, theory's temporality, that finds itself out of joint with time, with the tem temporalities of the world it seeks to order, is not a new quandary for Marxists. There are many of you in this room who are agrarian studies scholars and are fully 
cognizant of this. The problems, in fact, encapsulated by the agrarian question, formulated as the peasant question by Engels, later also known as the rural problem or the problem of agrarian transition, foregrounds a gap between observed phenomena and the predictions, and one might add the embedded political desires of theory regarding the prospects of a capitalist transformation of agriculture. Now, based on the long and occasionally tedious debates that consumed Indian Marxism from the late 1960s into the early 1980s, particularly the notorious mode of production debates, which went something like follow, as follows, India was not yet capitalist, so was it still feudal, or was it in a state of arrested time, semi-feudal? One is tempted to say that there was a lot of hand-wringing by Marxist intellectuals on the failure of a properly capitalist transformation of agriculture that would produce via a process of de-peasantization and polarization the necessary, necessary surplus for industrialization, an initial home market for manufactured goods, and an agricultural proletariat that could participate in a workers' revolution. Karl Kautsky, literary executor of Marx and Engels, leader of the German Social Democratic Party, leading spokesman of the Second International, who gave the agrarian question public prominence through his remarkable 1899 two-volume study by the same name, had put it bluntly. What did Kotsky say? With the growth of our party and the crisis in agriculture, it has now become one of the most important practical questions with which social democracy currently has to deal. The intervening period has also seen Marxism emerge as the basis for the socialist movement everywhere. And volume three of Capital with its brilliant treatment of ground rent has also now been published. However, agricultural development has given rise to phenomena which do not appear to be reconcilable with Marxist theories. The agrarian question has also therefore become a central problem of theory. And he goes on to say, social democracy has grown so enormously that it has outgrown the towns. Yet as soon as it takes to the countryside, it runs head on into the same mysterious force which had previously prepared such surprises for earlier democratic revolutionary forces. Far from making a rapid exit from the rural scene, small farms continue to exist. And the advance of large farms is a slow one, sometimes reversing entirely. The whole economic edifice, therefore, on which social democracy has based itself, on which it relies, seems to go awry the moment it tries to apply it to agriculture. So this brings me to a set of somewhat audacious, possibly foolhardy propositions. <laughs> Proposition one. There is a symmetry between the agrarian question and the predicaments posed by the informal economy question. They are both geographical phenomena that interrupt a linear Eurocentric conception of history and therefore demand an amendment to theory. To theory. And it deserves to be said that just as Kautsky's attempts to wrestle with the agrarian question led to a rich efflorescence of Marxist scholarship, heterodox Marxist scholarship, so too the emergence of the informal economy question. So for instance, with uh, Kautsky's attempts, um, the outcomes were, for example, the very different and brilliant forays of A.V. Chayanov on the one hand, and roughly around the same time of Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci's conjunctural mode of analysis was particularly important for giving Philip to a more open Marxism, indeed one that could even dare to ask, what is a Marxist? One outcome of this commitment to conjunctural analysis was a disembedding of politics 
from unilinear theory and its prescriptions. And it finds voice in one of Gramsci's keenest interpreters, the magnificent Stuart Hall, who insists that the political is a terrain of composition and recomposition of elements and forces that exhibit diverse spatial temporalities, open rather than closed, Marxism without guarantees, politics without guarantees. The persistence and expansion of the informal economy has posed similarly unsettling questions for left theory and politics and has likewise inaugurated a rich seam of scholarship in Latin America, Africa, and latterly in South and Southeast Asia. Work on surplus populations, the future of labor, and the adequacy of conventional left politics are all questions that have been taken up in profound and provocative ways. Kalyan Sanyal's book, 2007, Rethinking Capitalist Development, which selectively draws upon older currents in Latin American and African scholarship, is particularly noteworthy. While motivated by a self-professed desire to repoliticize development, Sanyal shies away from concrete diagnoses of conjuncture. That is to say, quote, the balance of forces, the state of overdetermination of the contradictions at any given moment. Recent political developments in India, which I will momentarily come to, notably the rise of the Hindu right-wing BJP, warrants an analysis of this particular conjuncture in India via Gramsci and Hall, a topic that I will, as I said, momentarily come back to. Proposition two. To observe a symmetry between the agrarian question and the informal economy question is not to claim equivalence. They flag theoretical responses to two very different conjunctures. At the risk of simplifying, the agrarian question asks, why is capital so slow, so slow to seize agriculture and expel surplus populations into the reserve army? Whereas the informal economy question asks, why is the real subsumption of labor to capital not happening as prescribed? In a way, they bookend the, linear, the unilinear conception of history that has exerted such a curious hold on the leftist imagination and leftist electoral politics, particularly in countries like India, with very damaging outcomes. Functional dualism is a prominent line of explanation that's advanced by Marxist scholars for the persistence of peasants and smallholder family farms on the one hand and urban informal economies on the other. So there is an effort here to now find a band-aid that can explain theory that seems to be out of joint with time. And the thesis of functional dualism, as many of you in this room know quite well, goes as follows. In permitting these supposedly anachronistic economic forms to exist, capital is able to lower its wage bill below socially necessary labor time by passing on some of the costs it would ordinarily incur for labor's reproduction onto the laborer and his family. And it's worth noting that in conventional functional dualist arguments, this subsidy is extracted over and above the unpaid labor time of women's reproductive and care work that has been so wonderfully examined by feminist political economy. In the context of the urban informal economy, by contrast, the premise is therefore that large segments of informal employment are little more than disguised wage work that represents a vast subsidy for capitalist enterprises insofar it makes labor, labor costs lower. Scholars like Jose Nunn in his marginal mass thesis and Kalyan Sanyal in Rethinking Capitalist Development reject the functional dualist argument on the grounds that we are now observing a qualitatively different process different even from the process described by Marx 
in his famous chapter 25 of Capital, Volume 1, The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation. In Sanyal's bleak assessment, I quote, bereft of any direct means of access to labor, the dispossessed are left only with labor power, but their exclusion from the space of commodity production, which is to say from the embrace of capital, does not allow them to turn their labor power into a commodity. In short, they're people without property and jobs. They're condemned to the world of the excluded, the redundant, the dispensable, having nothing to lose, not even the chains of wage slavery. There are legitimate reasons to question Sanyal's claim that the need economy, as he calls it, is a space outside capital, hence not to be equated with Marx's conception of the reserve army of the unemployed created by the development of capitalism and the rising organic composition of capital. There's also a plausible case to be made that Sanyal is somewhat careless in his reading of Marx. Joel Wainwright and I have argued recently that a more tenable way of conceptualizing the fault lines better than the sharp contrast that Sanyal draws between the excluded and the casualized or the need economy as opposed to informalization within the accumulation economy is to attend to the daily, short-term, and long-term spatio-temporal rhythms of work as the working classes balancing aspirations with constraints circulate between different sites and forms of work as well as work and non-work. This stance has been affirmed by recent labor histories which emphasize that the boundary between wage workers in formal capitalist production and those in non-wage, self-employed, home-based, piece rate, and contract work, among other forms of enterprise and livelihood generation, is thin and porous across which laborers travel to and fro. In other words, there is no unilinear transition that we can speak of. These sorts of insights suggest that in many, if not most, third world contexts, quote, the lumpen proletariat may be barely distinguishable from much of the rest of the working class, end of quote. And a historiography in which the formerly employed male industrial worker is accorded primacy as the subject of history or the proximate telos of left politics is a Eurocentric paradigm of limited relevance for most of the world. I read the recent accumulation of writings on surplus populations, Wasted Lives, Zygmunt Bauman, Wasteland of the Dispossessed, Kalyan Sanyal, Make Live and Let Die, Tanya Lee, A State of Wageless Life, Bill Denning, Beyond Populations with No Productive Function, Gavin Smith, The Precariat, Guy Standing, a floating reserve army, Jan Bremen, revolting subjects, Imogen Tyler, and most, result, most recently, expulsions, Saskia Sassen, to suggest that we are at, a, at an inflection point, perhaps a new conjuncture in the turbulent world history of capitalism, at the point where theory must self-correct. Proposition three, exclusion with its implied pathologies, economic, political, cultural, and biological, has long haunted liberal and left thinkers alike. Hegel's rabble, 1821 philosophy of right, Honor saint Fagier's dangerous classes, 1840, Karl Marx's lumpen proletariat, 1845, German ideology, and Henry Mayhew's the London poor, 1861, are but a few well-known examples of the anxiety incited by urban populations of cast out, submerged, declassed elements who are viewed as a source of indeterminacy in the social order. In the Western context, Stuart Hall and his colleagues in their magnificent Policing the Crisis from 1978 Peter Stolly Gross and Alan White in Poetics and Politics of Transgression 
Nicholas Tobin in The Loose Marks in Politics, and most recently Imogen Tyler in Revolting Subjects, 2013, have shown how racialized legacies of the dangerous classes has fostered authoritarian populism at various moments. In the contemporary Indian context, scholarship by young geographers, some possibly in this room, Ipsita Chatterjee's work on displacement and strange space in Ahmedabad, Karen Koyo's work on the everyday violence in Chennai slum resettlements, Sapna Doshi's work on slum redevelopment and criminalization of the urban poor in Mumbai, and Asher Gertner's work on nuisance talk and world-class city making in Delhi, powerfully demonstrate how people without property and jobs are continually stigmatized by the urban elite and policy establishment, which views them with anxiety and loathing as a nuisance, even danger to the proper order of things, giving warrant to capitalist projects of value. Frank Ruda's fascinating study of Hegel's philosophy of right reveals how the figure of the rabble represents a conceptual problem in Hegel's theory of the state that the philosopher is neither able to resolve nor sublate. Hegel is unable, unable to eliminate the specter, one that Marx elaborates, of accumulated inequalities congealing into a structure of necessity, capitalism that pauperizes, excludes, or simply expels some or many from the opportunities afforded by society denied society's protections and thus the capacity to become what Hegel calls substantial beings, these are through the intellect, through the intellect linked dependence of each on all, these unbound individuals become nobody, remainders. To quote Ruda, in this way civil society is incessantly compelled to recognize the inevitable production of that which it cannot recognize. Proposition 4a. Pure proletarian labor has never existed. Thanks, Miles. The production and reproduction of labor power have always been based on a mix of wage labor with non-valorized domestic, rural, and artisanal labor. With the onset of the global crisis in the 1970s, Various types of informality grew in prominence in periphery zones of the world economy as well as the core. It was in this context that there was a supply of demand to invoke the title of another of Stuart Hall's early articles from 1960 for concepts that would diagnose the resurgence of a welter of labor forms that took households even farther from the formerly employed solely wage-earning proletarian ideal of capitalist theory. Feminist geographers like Jill Hart, Judith Carney, Linda McDowell, Jerry Pratt, Cindy Katz, Susan Hansen, Vicki Lawson, and Richard Nagar, among others, have brilliantly demonstrated how households were sites where global political economic relations were constituted and played out. Now, to venture a big claim as if I haven't already, with some trepidation. I want to propose that the periphery zones were witness to three regionally variegated capitalist experiments in the first half of the 1970s aimed at managing people without property and jobs, to restore capitalist profitability and reestablish the US's geopolitical influence after the setbacks of the previous years. So in Latin America, import substitution industrialization, ISI, ceded to neoliberalism with the Chicago boys leading the charge. In Africa and South Asia, the Keynesian developmental state-led poverty management programs with African and South Asian elites and especially World Bank President Robert McNamara leading the charge, and in East Asia, excluding China, developmental state-led export-oriented industrialization with national elites and the US military industrial complex leading the charge. 
In the Caribbean and Latin America in the 1960s into the 1970s, we witnessed intense debates around marginality and informality as central questions of contemporary capitalism. In Africa, we see debates around the lumpen proletariat and the informal economy. The first five volumes of the now established journal Economy and Society from 1972 to 1976 feature a series of articles, many Africa focused, but some Latin America focused on modes of production with the central concern as the relationship or articulation between capitalists and other modes of production. Stuart Hall's famous essay, Race Articulation and Society Structured in Dominance is published in 1980. Meanwhile, as I've already mentioned, in India, we have a prolonged debate between 1969 and 1981 on modes of production, the crux of which was whether or not a progressive capitalist transformation of Indian agriculture was underway, and if not, why not? In short, if interruptions to a unilinear process of capitalist development was one locus of the informal economy debates and its variants, the other, was that the commodification of labor appeared to be in the process of slowing down, or worse, exhausting itself, while there was a growing quantity of labor power available for entry into the labor market, the economic transformations underway indicated that a growing proportion of this labor power could be neither bought nor sold, that is, converted into a commodity with any certainty or regularity. This was resulting in the proliferation, as these debates pointed out, and I'm quoting Anibal Kihano here, quote, non-wage forms of labor reproduced under the conditions of capital and articulated with it, end of quote. The East Asian case is admittedly a little more muddled, but it's certainly tenable to view export-oriented industrialization also as a strategy for mopping up surplus labor. Proposition 4B. By the mid-1990s, as many of you are keenly aware, these capitalist experiments had been standardized into a modular template with regional variations, neoliberalization, which is to say market, liber market rule with incentivized conduct and rudimentary safety nets to pacify people without property in jobs we might say, a muted Keynes, now as handmaiden to Hayek. <laughs> and the informal economy had been rewritten as a space of untapped entrepreneurship and consumption, as brilliantly demonstrated in Ananya Roy's book, Poverty Capital. Conceptually, the move between the late 1960s and the mid-1990s was from combating structural inequalities and seeking to reduce absolute disparities to combating poverty and seeking to offer a minimum to the most disadvantaged. The transformation involved a process of weak convergence between the core and the periphery. In the core countries, carrying out this revolution required rollback of years of work, delegitimizing social security and the institutions of the working class. In the periphery countries, the doctrine of market rule, liberalization and economic growth was, and continues to be, articulated with the doctrine of development. Initially poverty alleviation, these days entrepreneurship and social provisioning. In my 2008 book, Capital Interrupted, I wrote, the resounding verdict for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party in the December 2007 Gujarat state election has sharply upped the stakes. The opposition Congress Party's moral turpitude and lack of political imagination, combined with Modi's tactical shrewdness and orator oratorical ability to stitch together a populist Gujarati pride agenda that has tapped into the Hindu majority's development desires, sectarian prejudices, security, security fears, and regional resentment has enabled the BJP to capture 
117 out of 102 legislative assembly seats, far in excess of most expert predictions. Gujarat's brand of majoritarian development that strives to be inclusive of non-Muslim populations may well become the template for a refurbished Hindutva, in short, the kernel of a populist, Hindu nationalist political and economic program that could have surprising electoral traction if adeptly marketed through regional allies. So this was back in 2008, and I'm sorry to say that the chickens have come home to roost. These are the results from the 16th general election held last year in India, in which the BJP swept to a landslide victory, winning 282 of a possible 543 seats, which is to say 51% of seats in the lower house of the parliament. And when you combine the BJP and its allies, together they won 62% of the seats. It was a wipeout. The Indian National Congress, which was previously in power, um, was reduced almost to a non-entity, winning only 44 seats, and in combination with the alliance, only 60 seats. But what I really want you to look at is the left front. The left front won nine seats out of 543. Something's wrong with the left imagination in India. Nine seats and 3.25% of the popular vote. That's what the left front won. So as previously discussed, the last 15 years have been a period of shockingly uneven and jobless economic growth in India, making the country, according to Jean Drez and Amartya Sen, look more and more like islands of California in a sea of sub-Saharan Africa. Maybe sub-Saharan Africa might want to disagree, but it's a grim situation as any one who has even a glancing knowledge of India can tell you. In short, the BJP was able to vault to power using a Thatcherite playbook of the sort so acutely examined by Stuart Hall in a series of writings, most memorably, The Toad in the Garden, Thatcherite Thatcherism Among the Theorists, written in 1988, and later that same year, Thatcherism and the Crisis of the Left, The Hard Road to Renewal. So like Thatcherism, the key elements of the ideology that trucks under the name Moditva with Namo filling in for Maggie among adulating supporters. The ideology includes a bizarre combination of managerial competence, free enterprise and individual initiative, elimination of corruption, defending the nation's security, and achieving civilizational glory on the global stage. Less explicit but fully understood is a communal undertone that promises to discipline Muslims and other minorities, requiring them, among other injunctions, to be patriotic and to accept Hindutva as a way of life that encompasses all religions. The labile term development does the work of propagating the secular and non-secular aspects of Moditva to the BJP's diverse constituency. But even as we make these comparisons between Thatcherism and Moditva, we have to be cautious. And here there is an element of hope. The size of the BJP's electoral gains masks sharp geographic variation and the unsettling effects of India's first past the post election system. And here's something that shows you the changing electoral map of India between the 15th general election in 2009 and the 16th in 2014. You can see that there is a sweep or a seeming sweep for the BJP, but there are some, some really startling and hopeful numbers here, which is that the BJP has been able to come to power 
with a minoritarian vote. So they struck gold in, in about a handful of states and as a result um, were vaulted to power. So there's some hope here that in fact what the BJP has managed to achieve in India is not the kind of hegemony that Thatcherism was able to establish in the UK. Proposition 5C, 5B, sorry. Um, so, again, as I said, the comparisons between Thatcherism and, and Moditva need to be taken with a dose of salt. And recently, as some of you have possibly read, in the state of, in, in Delhi, uh, there was a, a, a populist party called Aam Admi Party, the ordinary man's party, which swept to power, winning 67 of 70 possible seats. Now, the Aam Admi Party is, it's an interesting um, case because the Aam Admi Party seems to have managed to get a, a, a number of votes, both from the urban poor, but also from, from the affluent classes. And it's worth asking whether the Aam Admi Party's victory in Delhi in fact marks a possible different kind of left politics. And I'm sorry to say that my own conclusions about the Aam Admi Party are a little more agnostic. I think that what they have managed to do is achieve a victory thanks to managerialism, which is to say a delivery-oriented politics rather than enact a radical innovation in democratic politics. But nevertheless, it's worth noting what the platform of this party was. It promised Jal Swaraj, water self-rule, which is that households would get 20,000 liters of water at no cost every month. It promised Bijli Swaraj, electricity self-rule, so halving the electricity tariffs and households using less than 400 units of power per month would get a 50% discount on their bills. It promised women's safety. It promised employment for all. It promised high quality education and healthcare for all. And it refused to engage in a politics of communalism. Its vote shares were highest among the city's younger and poorer voters, particularly Muslims and Dalits, who were undoubtedly fearful of the BJP's Hindu nationalism. And this has taken expression, many, many, ex many forms of expression, conversion or what are called Ghairwapsi initiatives, the arson of churches and mosques, attacks on Catholic schools and curricula, beef bans, pronouncements on Hindutva as the essence of India's civilization, and the implied admonition of Muslims and Dalits who make up the bulk of sanitation and waste workers in Narendra Modi's Swachh Bharat campaign or the Clean India campaign. How the AAP, the Aam Admi Party, delivers on its agenda of employment, healthcare, and education for all remains to be seen. But it's clear that its attention to the everyday realities of underclass existence in Delhi, the costliness of portable water and electricity, violence against women, workers on modes of public transportation, police and municipal corruption and harassment of their staff, poor sanitation and health have all struck a chord. So, to grasp at a conclusion, it is by now apparent that modernization has never quite operated in the teleological manner proposed 
by theorists from the North. Or to quote Jim Ferguson, once Euro-American modernity ceases to be the telos, the question of rank is de-developmentalized, and the stark status differentiations of the global economic system, global social systems that raw and naked, no longer softened by the promises of the not yet. If growing structural unemployment, diminishing opportunities to convert labor power into a commodity, disposability, exclusion, slow death, abandonment, archipelagic existence, mass alienation, and expulsion are the analytics that capture the racialized dynamics of global capitalism today, then, in combination with climate change, it raises profound questions for the future of humanity and the future of capitalism itself. I'm unwilling to abide an aesthetics of abjection as we tackle these big questions. The contemporary revolution from above, Wright, Hall, Massey, and Rustin in the Kilburn Manifesto entails a restructuring of state and society along market lines and a redistribution from poor to rich. But they also note that neoliberalism has never conquered everything. No matter how desperate their circumstances, the people I've met, the poor people I've met, attempt to fabricate meaningful lives. My brilliant friend Sharachari's work in Durban shows this vividly. There is, of course, boredom, drudgery, fatigue, sickness, extortion, humiliation, hunger, alcoholism, drug use, and violence that attend the lives of the urban underclasses. But there is also anger and contempt for exploiters, cognizance of inequality and injustice, stubbornness and outright defiance, a desire to get ahead combined with unexpected kindness, loyalty, striving for dignity, for autonomy, and cohabitation. The desire for autonomy pulses powerfully, revealing itself in unexpected sights. My colleague Sunil Kumar and I have met waste collectors who gave up waged factory work to enter the hard scrabble world of waste picking because they resented being bossed around and wanted more control of their own time, even if their newfound livelihood is unstable. What has recurrently surprised us is the hospitality and care within limits that people without property and jobs extend to each other. Bhagwan, the waste picker I described at the outset of this talk, is surprisingly accommodating in his attitude towards Bengali Muslims, who politicians and police brand as Bangladeshis, undocumented workers, in order to extort them. And he is accommodating even though Bangladeshis have now taken over the lower rungs of the informal waste economy in many cities of India. Bhagwan says, they work hard, they toil for long hours, they're trying to exist. Why should anyone resent that? Literate and curious, Bhagwan regularly reads discarded newspapers that he finds in the trash, as well as novels. Like many others who deal with day-to-day -day adversity, he is self-effacing and exhibits a cultivated stoicism. It's not altogether surprising to hear him describe his daily toil in terms that word verge on the lyrical. I think I give new life to things that are unwanted, that people are, have thrown away, he declares. He's a contemporary worker poet, akin to the historical figures who inhabit the pages of Ranciere's Proletarian Nights. At the Ghazipur and Okhla landfills in Delhi, I witnessed a different sort of accommodation. Solicitousness among permanent and contract staff of the municipal corporation for the families of waste collectors, particularly the children who scrounge for pickings at these dumps. Hiralal, who is the municipality's resident guard at the landfill, looks out for children who pick at the dump. He knows the name of every child, who is new, who is old, and who is the adult member of each one's family. 
However, the recent trend towards privatization of waste in Indian cities is threatening even these livelihoods of people without property and jobs. So where do we go from here? Saskia Sassen claims that we are now at the beginning of a global phase that is, quote, marked by expulsions. From life projects and livelihoods, from membership, from the social contract at the heart of liberal democracy, end quote. Exaggerated or not, I think, as Stuart Hall has argued in the context of Thatcherism, and I have proposed in the context of Moditwa, that we now live in an age where capitalism has written the social contract. For example, the inclusion promised by development under Nehruvian socialism or even the early years of Indira Gandhi. We must accept that people who lack property and jobs or classes of labor, as Henry Bernstein calls them, constitute the modal form of employment in India and most of the world. Politically, this implies a departure from the familiar notion of classes as self-evident agents of social mobilization. Since they're not so much social groups as categories which constitute catchment areas out of which people can be recruited to organized political and other activity and which also throw up associations and organizations which can be won over. And it has to be pointed out, they can be won over for left projects or right projects. In short, we're back in the world of Antonio Gramsci and Stuart Hall, politics without guarantees. The recent history of waste privatization in India shows a demonstrated bias towards large private firms overlooking alternative models of associationism and petty proprietorship involving creative partnerships with waste pickers, waste pickers organizations, and petty scrap dealers that can leverage their practical knowledge and livelihood needs. In the process, possibly avoiding the pitfalls and failures of corporate enterprise while generating safe and sustainable livelihoods for hundreds of thousands. Bangalore's attempt to handle wet and dry waste in a decentralized manner, thanks to the efforts of Hasiru Dalla, a waste pickers cooperative led by labor activist Nalini Shekhar, is one evolving model. The Bangalore City Corporation has impaneled 45 firms, private firms, for handling the bulk of, bulk of the waste of bulk generators. Of these 45, 22 are waste pickers organizations. They're involved in many aspects of waste management including the setting up of biomethanation plants. Pune Municipal Corporation's arrangement with Swatch, an organization of women waste pickers that has emerged, is another alternative that is on offer. Creative examples from other parts of the world abound. Melanie Sampson has documented the efforts of Johannesburg's reclaimers to resist waste privatization and secure from city authorities recognition for their rights to an intricate knowledge of the art of waste recycling. Rosalind Frederick's research with Dakar's trash workers reveals their battle to make their labor manifest and sculpt a vernacular understanding of its work. She writes, quote, through their conviction that trash work is God's work and their practical efforts to order the city, the workers demand a remoralization of work and state claims for a more ethical infrastructure, end quote. A world dominated by people without property and jobs is unsettling. But it doesn't have to be a world without justice. Perhaps it's an opportunity for leftist imaginations to think outside the box for both theory and practice to experiment. Thank you.
curious if you could just lay out what the agrarian question adds. Why, why set it up in this way? In the sense that I, I see the symmetries, and the symmetries are interesting. So a few kind of questions about that. One, the agrarian question, in part, is about land and the difference that nature makes. So what's the particularities of the production processes that you're looking at that may make the difference in their kind of materiality? So that's the first one. The second one that I'm really curious about is Bernstein's still deeply kind of structuralist. Bernstein is no kind of Gramscian. Bernstein is no kind of Stuart Hall. So this phrase, classes of labor, it's evocative, it's interesting, it's, it, it's, it's important. Yet his analysis is still very much about a very kind of Leninist notion of differentiation. Hmm. So I'm just curious about A, why Bernstein, given all kind of the broader debates on your very question. And secondly, then, what kind of a Gramscian or Hall-inspired reading of the agrarian question might look like for you? And I think that your, your book, obviously, your earlier book speaks to this to a degree, but I was just wondering if you could kind of lay it out for me and us, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Shall I go ahead? I'll take a couple more. Anything else uh, urgent at the moment, or for, should the name proceed? <laughs> Since I have my marching orders from Nick. Thanks for those uh, questions. So in setting up the symmetry, but not the equivalence between the agrarian question and the informal economy, I was, I think, trying to signal what I sense were two very different moments. One, a moment where the anxiety was, how would we actually create a process of proletarianization that would, in fact, release the surplus population that would then ally with um, the workers in urban areas to lead a workers' revolution. I mean, the agrarian question was, on the one hand, um, very much mired in a stages conception of history as you know, um, which was later then repudiated, among others, by Gramsci. But uh, th th there is also the, the issue here, uh, which is the, the political dimension of the agrarian question, which was what is to be done, given that we have this, um, this unruly scen scenario where uh, the agrarian landscape is not going through the kind of transition that theory predicts. So there's this notion of theory being out of joint with time. And so in, in some ways it's representing, as I said, one of the bookends of um, the surplus population issue. The informal economy question comes at another conjuncture when, in fact, there do seem to be uh, a lot of people in urban areas who have, in fact, uh, been um, expelled or have willingly chosen to leave or circulate between rural and urban areas. And the informal economy question is, well, they're not being absorbed into forms of employment that theory had um, anticipated, and again, the dual economy models in economics and other social science disciplines are uh, iconic here, but certainly modernization theory was implicated in predicting this, this kind of uh, idea of transition, and the informal economy question is really addressing the issue of um, real subsumption which is not happening. So on the one hand, the agrarian question, why aren't surplus populations being expelled fast enough? On the other hand, the informal economy question, why aren't surplus populations being absorbed fast enough? Right? And so that's the symmetry that I was trying to, um, trying to work with, perhaps um, in, 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 a, in a kind of unruly manner. But partly what I was trying to say was that isn't it sort of strange, isn't it um, interesting that the left imagination has uh, come at 
the problem of theory at these two different conjunctures, asking two different questions, but both about surplus populations. Right? And I, I, I really kind of use them as a narrative device to create a certain kind of arc for the argument. Now, with the informal economy question, right, I also wanted to point out, as I did later, um, which is that if, in fact, we start thinking about the possibilities for left politics, precisely because people without property in jobs construct livelihoods through this complex combination of employment and non-employment, right? which is to say formal employment and informal employment, but also um, substantial periods of no work. Um, we can't neatly slot them into any kind of class category, which of course doesn't mean that political imagination, political organizing has to stop. And in fact, what I was trying to suggest towards the end with the gesture to forms of associationism and um, petty proprietorship as possible models that left politics may want to pursue um, was, was simply trying to open up a conversation, a conversation that is that has to be set against the backdrop of the abysmal performance of left parties in India. In fact, um, there are others in this room who know a lot more about um, the trajectory of left politics in India, but um, the, the, the winning nine electoral seats, I think, says something. Um, winning 3.25% of the popular vote, I think, says something. And I think there is a way in which the left imagination is still anchored in this understanding of union or unionized politics. Now, union politics can still have a place, but I think it has to take a different form. I think it has to take different modes of organizing. And that brings me to Henry Bernstein, who perhaps I used in an opportunistic way. I really wanted to um, try and evoke some similarities between this idea, which I find very evocative, Peter Worsley's idea of people without property and jobs, which he's writing, he's writing this in 1972, describing cities in Africa, and engaging with Franz Fanon's different reading right, of the London proletariat, and you know, Bernstein's later arguments coming from, yes, absolutely right, a different perspective, but thinking also then about these classes of labor who have these um, very complicated forms of livelihood that involve bricolage and really um, may be their form of livelihoods for entire lifetimes. So I think that uh, again begs the question about um, you know, what we might want to do as people in this room and again the, this idea of people without property and jobs or classes of labor, I think lends itself quite well to thinking with both Gramsci and Hall because it really does become then a, 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 a process of, of, of trying to organize um, collectivities being attentive to um, both kind of the vernacular forms that exist within these groups that Worsley calls catchment areas of um, collectivities uh, and, and engaging in a process of hegemonizing that really is willing to step out of some of the entrenched forms that um, the, the left imagination remains anchored in. So, I don't know if I've answered your question. You had one more point about the materiality of right, the production process in agriculture and informal economy, and we can talk about that as well later.
Renee, I wanted to first, uh, as somebody who studied, uh, studies informal recyclers or waste papers, as you refer to them, I wanted to first thank you for putting your intellect and your theoretical capacity towards this issue. I think that's really important. My question for you is about the choice to frame this uh, process of expulsion and disposability as a premise, almost as a fait accompli, rather than as a hegemonic project, which is to say something that has, it, you know, appears to be a monolith, but actually has its internal contradictions, uh, has its fractures, and is interruptible. And the reason that I raise this is that I think it's really important for us, first of all, to not adopt the language of this hegemonic discourse, because we run the risk of reinscribing the dehumanizing messages of that discourse, but also because, thinking from the perspective of Stuart Hall, adopting that also has the potential to foreclose some of the transformative subjectivities embodied by informal recyclers themselves that you started to allude to at the end, but we see lots of resistance. We see lots of ways that people insert themselves into economies and public space and political discourses from informal recyclers themselves in the global north and the global south. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you for your question. So maybe I can just begin by noting that um, I, that's why I explicitly tried to say that I disavow a, an aesthetics of objection. I, I don't want to slip into the dehumanizing language even if unwittingly that some of this scholarship on surplus populations can in fact uh, elicit. So I, I take your point fully there and, and one of the things that uh, I was trying to assert was precisely that um, no matter how difficult their circumstances, people do attempt to varying degrees to fabricate meaningful lives. Um, and I did want to sort of put that across. Um, but in terms of you know, s somehow accepting this as fair complé, um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, I'm, I'm necessarily doing that. In some ways, I was trying to make the case through the various propositions that the transformations that we have seen over the last um, three or four decades um, ha has in fact been the evolution of various kinds of capitalist experiments to manage people without property and jobs. And again, you know the informal economy literature and one of the key aspects that keeps coming up is of course that when initially this scholarship begins, the informal economy is still seen as ephemeral, right? Something that's basically uh, a, a kind of transitional holding space for people who are not being absorbed quickly enough into the formal economy or really subsumed. But by the 1990s, um, there is a widespread change where the informal economy is seen as a permanent fixture of the landscape. And the, the pie chart that I showed you uh, very early on from the, the National Commission for Enterprise of the Ur Unorganized Sector, it's based this government commission that was set up in India, which used uh, government of India's own statistics to come up with uh, infl informal employment numbers it's, it's hard to argue when you have almost 90% of employment in the informal sector. We can dispute the numbers. Some people say, well, it's lower. It's about 75%. That's still really high, right? And so I, I, I don't know if, you know, if, if I'm really asserting that something is fair complete, I would say that I'm simply working with what the situation appears to be. Uh, and, and again, um, you know, responding or echoing the, the, the point that I made when I was responding to Michael, um, I think this is precisely the, the kind of conjuncture where uh, the work of someone like uh, Stuart Hall or Antonia Gramsci becomes uh, deeply relevant um, because um, I, I didn't use necessarily the language of counter-hegemony, but clearly one has to be, I think, willing to engage in leftist experiments which include 
trying to step out of categories of uh, thinking that are deeply familiar and perhaps um, comforting to us. We also have to step out of our own desires for certain kinds of political resolutions. I hope I answered at least part. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, let's thank Benet one more time.